So the word for today comes from the third chapter of Hebrews. And again, I'll be reading the whole third chapter, so get comfortable, but pay attention. There's such good things, good statements of faith here. We begin with the first verse. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of God still speaking today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's start with that beginning verse. It reminds us that this letter is written to people that were members of the Christian family. Remember, holy brothers, that you share in a heavenly calling, and this heavenly calling implies that God initiated their faith. God initiates and calls us to himself in faith, and then we serve God as we grow in faith. We can think of this as our own heavenly calling. And then I like that illustration of the house. Moses was a worthy servant in the house of God, but God, Christ, built the house. That's an illustration for the church itself, the people of God. And again, this is another, previously we had compared Christ Jesus to angels and how Jesus is much more worthy of glory and honor than angels are. And here we're saying, yeah, Moses was a faithful servant, but Jesus Christ is much more glorious and even Moses, the giver of God's law, the writer of the first five books of the Old Testament, but Christ is more important. And then we have this, this move 
where it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. And right there, he's again referencing and quoting Old Testament scripture. This is a psalm, and I forget which psalm it is, but it's a psalm that reflects back into the Exodus story of the Israelites. But that, as the Holy Spirit says, shows us that they believed what we believe. All of God's word was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. Humans, human beings wrote it, but they were inspired by God. We believe all of God's word was given to us by God through the Holy Spirit. And it starts, that that psalm is used to give us a warning. And that warning is very clear. It says, take care, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that leading you to fall away from the living God. It's a warning about the danger of doubting and not trusting God. The story of the exodus of the Israel people from Egypt and their experiences with unbelief are being used to illustrate spiritual lessons for us today. Think of the people of Israel. They were kept in bondage in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. People today are in bondage to sin and death in this world. God's chosen people, the Israelites, they were delivered from bondage. How? Part of it was, if you remember the story of Moses, God spoke to Moses, tell the people to sacrifice a lamb or a goat, an unblemished one-year-old, take the blood, put it on your doorpost so the angel of death that night would not enter in and kill the firstborn. They're delivered out of Egypt by the blood of the lambs and the power of God. And Jesus Christ is often referenced as the Lamb of God because we are delivered from sin and death by the blood he shed on the cross. Anyone who believes that Jesus died for their sins is immediately delivered from the bondage of sin and death by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if we look back at that whole story of the Exodus, the God's people being led out of Egypt, led through the wilderness, we see that God did not want his people to remain in Egypt. They were there for hundreds of years. He didn't want them to stay in the wilderness. Just like God today does not want people to stay, to remain in bondage to sin and death. God wants us to be set free so that we can live in God's blessings today. God desired and called them to enter into this glorious promised inheritance, the promised land, a land, he says, flowing with milk and honey. That was the land of Canaan. That was their promised land. Yet when they arrived at the edge of the promised land on the banks, I believe it was the Jordan, the people cried out as one, We are not able. There were three men, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. They stood firm and they shouted, we are able with God's help. But because of the people's lack of trusting God, they could not, they did not go forward in their faith, but they went backward in their unbelief. Those people of God, they failed to see the promised land ahead of them. They failed to stand firm in the faith. They failed to stand firm in God's promises to them. He had promised them this land. This is your land. This is your inheritance. So what does Cain in the promised land represent for us today? What if we think of it as our own spiritual inheritance? When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we enter into the promises of God being fulfilled in our lives. We're saved through faith, and we enter into his promises for us today as believers in Christ Jesus. When Joshua, later, 40 years later, led God's people into the promised land, they crossed the Jordan River by faith. They knew there would be battles. They knew there would be problems. They knew there would be pain. 
That entire first generation that was led out of Egypt, they all died. Only Joshua crossed over as their leader. But they all trusted in God's promise for them. And they went forward in faith into that promised land. Jesus can deliver anyone from sin and death and into God's wonderful promises. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we enter into the promises that God made for his faithful people. They can be fulfilled in our lives as God wills it for us. Being faithful followers of Jesus and disciples of Jesus Christ doesn't mean we aren't going to face problems. I'm going to pause for a second, and I don't like to do this, but I want to divide people into two groups. We have people who have not accepted Christ as their Savior. We can call them unbelievers. And then we have those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. They believe and trust that Christ died on the cross for their sins, and he rose to new life. They're saved. They're saved by the blood of Jesus. Yet some of them, many of them, doubt the word of God and live with a restless unbelief. These are good Christians, but they're not claiming their own spiritual inheritance. God was with his people in the wilderness, but they did not enjoy the fullness of all God's blessings because of their unbelief. They didn't cross over into the promised land. That's what it's like for people today who've accepted Jesus into their lives. But they don't or won't fully trust in God, in God's will for them, in God's word for their lives. How many of us cry out, we are not able, when we're presented with problems, to cross over in our lives? How often do we see problems of as unmanageable, I can't do this. It, it demands too much out of us. The challenge, our challenge, is to stand firm like Moses, like Joshua, like Caleb, and shout out, I am able with God's help. Mm, hallelujah. So how can we do that? How can we persevere in our faith? This is what I'm getting to here. It's in today's scripture. We need to make sure our hearts are aligned with God. That's here, verse 12 again, this time from the Amplified Bible. It says, take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart. And it defines that this way. It says, which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord. On the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. It starts with our hearts. That's what God's word shows us. Think back to the original giving of the law from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. What does God say? His first commandment to the people, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and with all your might. Why does God start with our hearts? And I put this quote in the bottom of our bulletins today. Uh, it's someone I use a lot when I study. Warren Wearsby wrote that at the heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. The people of Israel, they erred in their hearts. They failed to keep God's command to love God with all their heart. Their hearts wandered from God, his word, and his promises. And think, they had witnessed with their own eyes the miracles that God performed in Egypt to set them free, to bring them out of bondage. Yet they still suffered from the evilness of unbelief in their hearts. They doubted what God had promised them. The truth is that we either love God with our whole heart, which allows us to trust in God fully, or we don't give all our heart to God. And that's what allows unbelief to creep into our lives. When a person has an erring heart, a disbelieving heart, 
the end result can be a hard heart. And a hard heart is insensitive to the word and the work of God in the world today. Think about the people of Israel. Their hearts were so hard, they actually wanted to go back to Egypt, go back to slavery and bondage. Imagine wanting to exchange your freedom in God for slavery in Egypt. So what does all this in the Exodus story mean for us today living as Christians? I think what this shows us is every Christian is going to be tempted to give up trusting Jesus as their Lord. It's easier to go back into the systems of the world, a life of compromise, which leads to a life of bondage. This happens especially during times of suffering and persecution. Instead of listening and trusting God's voice, we give in to the voices of the world. Sometimes suffering is simply just a part of life. It's a part of our world. We're not living in a perfect world. We live in a fallen world. There's pain and suffering around us. And it's not God's fault. It's a result of the sin of the world, the sin of other people, and the sin of ourselves. However, suffering can be used for God. If we think back to the history of the Christian church, even today, the fires of suffering and persecution have always purified God's people, the church. God can also use suffering to teach us, to help us grow in our faith. And as we grow in our faith, that goal is to become more like Jesus. God can also use suffering to bring us closer to him and closer to other people, closer to one another. So what does it mean to be a Christian living in the middle of suffering? It means trusting in God. We trust in God and his love, even when we don't understand the suffering we might be experiencing. It means allowing God to use our own suffering for his glory and his good. And it means reaching out to other people so that we can share God's love with them. We aren't supposed to do life alone. That's not what God intended. And again, this is verse 13 from the Amplified Bible. But continually encourage one another every day as long as it is called today. And there is an opportunity so that none of you will be hardened, and it describes hardened as into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, its cleverness, delusive glamour, and sophistication. We need each other. That's what God's word shows us. It's so important that we encourage one another. We as Christians are mutually responsible for one another. That's what God's word shows us. We aren't supposed to live out our faith in solitude. We need faithful people that can speak godly words into our lives, especially when we're going through a time of trial. Having some type of accountability structure with faithful friends allows us to honestly share our struggles. God uses people in our lives to help us in our own struggles. People are an important part of God's sanctifying grace working in our lives to make us more like Jesus Christ. We need to encourage and support one another in our journeys of faith. But we also need to know that God accepts us and loves us wherever you are on that journey of faith. However, God loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants you to grow in faith, grow in knowledge of his love and mercy. God wants us to love him with our whole hearts, because that's the key to becoming more like Jesus Christ. God works in our hearts and our minds to lead us into the future, into the fullness of Jesus Christ. Many people are willing to accept Jesus Christ as their savior. Yes, Christ 
thank you for saving me. However, Jesus needs to be both Savior and Lord. He needs to be as our Savior and our Lord. If we want to experience all that God has planned to bless us with in our lives, accepting Christ as our Lord means we're going to let him guide our lives. And you can't do that with a hard heart. Loving God with our whole heart is the key to preventing a hard heart. A heart doesn't harden all of a sudden overnight. It's a process. It begins with an erring heart or a disbelieving heart. We just don't believe something that God's word has said to us. It's a heart that's prone to sin and disobedience. I forget who said it's it's not like we don't understand God's word. We say we don't understand it because if we understand it, then we have to commit to following it. There are many different ways that an erring heart can manifest itself. And that can lead us into making bad decisions, bad choices to sin. And that in turn leads us away from God. It's all it also can cause us to doubt God's love and God's goodness. A disbelieving heart can't fully trust God. And if you're struggling with a disbelieving or an erring heart, there's hope. God accepts you where you are. He loves you and he wants to help. Christ has provided the way for us to be forgiven of our sin, to be forgiven of our disbelief so we can have that new heart that's in alignment with God's will. And it's through our confession and repentance that God forgives us. He works in our hearts and lives to change us. Jesus preached in his earthly ministry. His message was simple. Repent and believe the truth that God loves you. You know, we say, Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is the truth that God loves each and every one of us. So repent and believe that God loves you. Because what happens if we, even as believers in Christ, if we doubt God's word and rebel against him, we're going to miss out. We might not miss out on heaven. Our salvation is secure. As long as we confess him raised from the dead, died for my sins. But if we don't take him as Lord, we're going to miss out on some of the way God wants to bless us in our lives. Canaan is that illustration of spiritual believers leaving, not believing in the inheritance they have in Christ. God has promised to us, it's in his word. And with our salvation secure in Christ, We can rest in God's will and promises, not till we get to heaven, but today. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about God's rest. But we're secure. Our salvation is secure. So we can rest in God and his promises today. And the truth is, we either love God with our whole heart or have to learn how to love God with our whole heart. So that we can fully trust God. We can persevere in our faith by having our hearts fully aligned and loving God. And may we all learn to love God with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, and all our strength. Amen.